besides th that there's no experimental validation, you've uh, written that a big hole in string theory has been its perturbative definition. Yeah. Perhaps that's one, can you explain what that means? Well, maybe to begin with, I mean, I think that, I mean, the simplest thing to, to say is, you know, the, the initial idea really was that, okay, we're, we have this, instead of what's great is we have this thing that only works, that's very structured and has to work in a certain way for it to make sense. And, um, but, but then you ended up, you ended up in 10 space time dimensions. And so to get back to physics, you had to get rid of five of the dimensions, six of the dimensions. And the, the bottom line, I would say, in some sense, is very simple. That what people just discovered is just there. There's kind of no particularly nice way of doing this. There's an infinite number of ways of doing it, and you can get whatever you want depending on how you do it. So the you you end up the whole program of starting at ten dimensions and getting to four just kind of collapses out of a, a lack of any way to kind of get to where you want because you can get anything. The the hope around that problem has always been that. The standard formulation that we have of string theory, which is, you can go in by the name perturbative, but it, it's kind of, um, there's a standard way we know of given a classical theory of constructing a quantum theory and and, and working with it, which is this the so-called perturbation theory, that um, that we know how to do, and that that by itself just just doesn't doesn't give you any hint as to what to do about the six dimensions. So actual perturbative string theory by itself really only works in ten dimensions. So you have to start making some kinds of assumptions about how I'm going to go beyond this formulation that we really understand of string theory and get rid of these six six dimensions. So kind of the simplest one was the um, the Clabiau postulate, but um. When that didn't really work out, people have tried more and more different things, and and the hope has always been that the solution to this problem would be that you would find a a deeper and better understanding of what string theory is that would actually go beyond this perturbative expansion and w which would um which would generalize this and and that and that once you had that it would um it would solve this problem of, of it would pick out what to do with the six dimensions. How difficult is, is this problem? So if I could restate the problem, it seems like there's a very consistent physical world operating in four dimensions. And uh, how do you map a consistent physical world in 10 dimensions to a consistent physical world in four dimensions? Right. And how, how difficult is this problem? Is, it, is that something you can even answer? Um, just in terms of physics intuition, in terms of mathematics, mapping well, from 10 well, dimensions to four dimensions. Well, basically, I mean, you have to get rid of the of six of the dimensions. So so there's, I mean, there, there's kind of two ways of doing it. One is what we call compactification. You say that there really are 10 dimensions, but for whatever reason, six of them are really, are so, so small, we can't see them. So you basically t start out with 10 dimensions and what we call, you know, make make, make six of them not go out to infinity, but just kind of a finite extent, and then make that size go down so small it's unobservable. But that's, that's like, that's a math trick. So can you also help me build an intuition about how rich and interesting the world in those six dimensions is? So compactification seems to imply the... <laughs> Well, it's, it's not it's very kind of, interesting. Well, no, but but the problem is that what you learn if you start doing math, mathematics and looking at geometry and topology and in more and more dimensions is that, I mean, asking the question like, what are all possible six dimensional spaces? is just, it's kind of an unanswerable question. It's just, uh, I mean, there, it's even kind of technically undecidable in some way. There's just, there's just too, too, there are too many things you can do with all these. If you start trying to make, if you start trying to make one-dimensional spaces, it's like, well, you, you got a line, you can make a circle, you can make graphs, you can kind of see what you can do. But as you go to higher and higher dimensions, there are just so many ways you can put things together of and get something of that dimensionality. And so, it, it, it um, unless you have some very very strong principle which is going to pick out some very specific ones of these six-dimensional spaces, and there are just too many of them, and you can get anything you want. But um, so if you have ten dimensions, 
the kind of things that happen, I'll say that's actually the way, that's actually the fabric of our realities, 10 dimensions. There's a limited set of behaviors of objects, I don't know, even know what the right terminology to use, that can occur within, the, within those dimensions, like in reality. Yeah. yeah. And so, like, what I'm getting at is like, is there some consistent constraints? So if you have some constraints that map to reality, then you could start saying like, dimension number seven is kind of boring. All the excitement happens in the spatial dimensions one, two, three. Yeah. And time is also kind of boring. Yeah. And like, some are more exciting than others. Or we can use our metric of beauty. Uh, some dimensions are more beautiful than others. Once you have an actual understanding of what actually happens in those dimensions in our physical world, as opposed to sort of all the possible things that could happen. In some sense, I mean, just the basic fact is you need to get rid of them. We don't see them. So you, you need to somehow explain them. You have to, you, the main thing you're trying to do is to explain why we're not seeing them. And so you, you, can, you have to c come up with some theory of these extra dimensions and, and how they're going to behave. And string theory gives you some ideas about how to do that. But, but the, the bottom line is where you're trying to go with this whole theory you're creating is to just make all of its effects essentially unobservable. So it's a, it's not a really, <laughs> it's an inherently kind of dubious and worrisome thing that you're trying to do there. Why are you just adding in all this stuff and then trying to explain why we don't see it? I mean, it just. This may be a dumb question, but it's, is this an obvious thing to state that those six dimensions are unobservable or anything beyond four dimensions is, is unobservable? Or, do you leave a little door open to saying the current tools of physics, and obviously our brains are un unable to observe them, yeah. but we may need to come up with methodologies for observing them. So as opposed to collapsing your mathematical theory into four dimensions, or leaving the door open a little bit to, maybe we need to come up with tools that actually allow us to directly measure those dimensions. Yes, I mean, but you, I mean, you can certainly ask, you know, assume, that, that we've got model, look look at models with more dimensions and ask, you know, what would the observable effects, how would we right. know this? And you go out and do experiments. So for instance, you have a, like gravitationally, you have an inverse square law of forces. Okay, if you had more dimensions, that inverse square law would change to something else. So you can go and start measuring the inverse square law and say, okay, inverse square law is working, but maybe if I get, get and it turns out to be actually kind of very, very hard to measure gravitational effects at even kind of, you know, somewhat macroscopic distances because they're so small. Mm -hmm. So you can you can start looking at the inverse square law and say start trying to measure it at shorter and shorter distances and, and see if there were extra dimensions at those distance scales, you would start to see the inverse square law fail. And um, so people look for that, and again, you don't see it, but. You can, I mean, there's all sorts of experiments of this kind you can you can imagine which test for effects of extra dimensions at different at different distance scales, but you know none of them. I mean, they they all just don't work. Nothing yet. Nothing yet. But you could say ah, but it, it it's if it's just it's just much much smaller. You can say that. <laughs> which, by the way, makes LIGO and uh, the detection of gravitational waves quite an incredible project. 